previous units focused on the change in allele frequencies over time. This is generally referred to as microevolution. This video, however, will focus more on macroevolution, that is the formation of new species. So we will focus primarily on the basic processes by which new species are thought to arise. And first of all, let's address this basic question, what is a species? It's not as easy or straightforward as you might think. For example, uh, consider the the samples on the screen here, mules, ligers, wolfens, these all represent hybrids formed by the union of two separate species. Moreover, these organisms often tend not to be fertile. So although they of course exist as organisms, they tend not to be able to propagate themselves and produce offspring. So do these represent individual species or not? Again, it's not always an easy uh, question to answer. Generally, uh, there are uh, there are actually a variety of ways in which we can define species, but generally the most common used uh, commonly used definition of species uh, corresponds to the biological species concept. This essentially identifies species in terms of reproductive isolation. That is, groups of organisms that can breed with each other and tend to produce fertile offspring, well, they constitute a single species. So again, the idea is that, that, there, that this, the, the definition relies on reproductive isolation. And there are a variety of ways that uh, separate species are, are, tend to be prevented from, from uh, mating with each other and producing viable offspring. For example, we can talk in terms of prezygotic examples and post-zygotic examples. So for example, this table illustrates several prezygotic mechanisms of isolation. For example, populations uh, often are, are reproductively, reproductively isolated simply because they breed at different times or perhaps different locations, or individuals might display different courtship uh, behaviors, or sperm and eggs simply might not be capable of fertilizing each other. So again, these are all considered prezygotic mechanisms simply because they prevent the formation of viable zygotes. On the other hand, there are examples of different species that can breed with each other. Uh, consider the mules, for example, a cross between a horse and a donkey. Um, so hybrids can be produced, but uh, they tend often to be sterile. So that would be an example of post-zygotic isolation. So again, biological species concept focusing on the, the idea of reproductive isolation. Uh, on the other hand, what if you're dealing with fossils, groups of organisms that are now extinct? Of, of course, you can't really uh, study their, their uh, reproductive behaviors, so often you have to simply rely on structural features. So another way in which people tend to define species uh, relies on the so-called morpho-species concept. And again, this just is, it, it's often a judgment call. If you're, if you're studying fossils and you find two or more groups of fossils, often you have to decide simply based on structural features whether or not they are members of the same species. And again, it's often uh, difficult and often just a, a judgment call. More recently, uh, another way in which we have been defining species is, 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 to, is represented by the so-called phylogenetic species concept. So the idea is if you can create phylogenetic trees uh, of different groups of organisms, the smallest identifiable monophyletic groups that you can identify, well, those represent distinct species. And so sometimes there's agreement between these, these way, different ways of, of defining species, but sometimes there is not. So what are some of the ways in which new species are thought to arise? Well, let's begin with just a, a brief mention of this general process referred to as allopatric speciation. Allopatric speciation simply occurs anytime groups of organisms become separated from the parental population. So illustrated schematically here, we can talk about uh, allopatric speciation by dispersal, meaning that groups of organisms from the original population can be dispersed and colonize new areas. And over time, those two separate groups can diverge into two separate species. And this is thought to happen for example, sometimes there are birds uh, that can be flying in, in coastal areas, and if a big storm comes, they can actually disperse those birds to, to other islands where they remain and, and uh, uh, repopulate uh, the, the, the new island. And again, over time, uh, those 
produce two separate species. On the other hand, we can talk about allopatric speciation by vicariance, illustrated over here toward the right. This essentially occurs any time uh, an area or environment becomes separated. Uh, in, this, in this instance, a river is changing course, separating the two species of organisms. And again, over time, if they're isolated or separated from each other, they diverge into separate species. So in addition to allopatric speciation, there are examples of sympatric speciation. And so sympatric speciation refers to the formation of new species uh, within the general geographic area of the original population of organisms. So uh, again, sympatric speciation, in this case, individuals are not physically separated from each other. As an example, consider these soapberry bugs. You see one here toward the left. These are found in, in the southern parts of the US and other regions as well. But these soapberry bugs, uh, they tend to feed on these balloon vines, illustrated to the right here. And you can see the balloon vines have a fairly large fruit. And although the image on the left doesn't show it, the soapberry bugs themselves tend to have a fairly long mouth part, or proboscis, which they use to pierce the, the fruits of these, of these trees and, of course, tap into their, into their nutrients. So an interesting observation occurred when another species of, of plant, of tree, was introduced to parts of Florida. And so what we see on this image is the, the normal balloon vine with those large fruits that the soapberry bugs tend to eat on over toward the right. And to the left, the uh, fruit structure of this newly introduced tree, this flat potted golden rain tree, soapberry bugs are able to feed on those fruits as well. Notice a clear difference in size between the two fruits. It turns out that when people studied not only the, the, the size of the fruits, but also when they studied the, the bugs, the soapberry bugs that were feeding off of and living on these two different species of plants, what they found, if you focus initially on the bottom pane here, is of course the, the fruits of the, of the balloon vines, the native plants, they were much larger than this newly introduced plant shown to the left here in red. Also, so was the length of the mouth part of the soapberry bugs growing on each of those two plants. So what we have happening here is, is essentially an example of disruptive selection. So the soapberry bugs on the, on the native uh, balloon, balloon plants, they tend to stay there. They tend not to uh, mix a whole lot with the soapberry bugs living on the newly introduced plant. And so over time, it's thought that t these two populations of soapberry bugs will diverge into two separate species. Again, classic example of disruptive selection. It's also thought that new species can arise through hybridization. So at the beginning of this video, we showed you pictures of mules and wolfins and ligers, but plants also are notorious for hybridizing with each other. As an example, the, in the southwestern part uh, of the United States, there are a variety of, of sunflowers that grow there. And what we see here are three different species of sunflowers, Helianthus annuus, Helianthus pinellaris, and Helianthus anomalous. And people were curious about the relationship between these three species. In fact, they hypothesized that Helianthus annuus and Helianthus pinellaris perhaps hybridized with each other to produce this third species, Helianthus anomalous. So if that was a hypothesis, how could they actually test that hypothesis? Well, what they're able to do is, is in the greenhouse, literally just grow up some of these Helianthus annuus plants and Helianthus pinellaris plants and then cross them with each other. And they essentially do this for several generations. So it's illustrated here. So again, crossing these two species with each other and then crossing those F1 individuals with each other and even back crossing with the individual plants, do this for several generations and then compare the genetic makeup of the hybrids that are produced in the lab, in the greenhouse, with the genetic makeup of this, this third species out in nature, this Helianthus anomalous. And when they do that, sure enough, the genetic makeup of the hybrids that they produce in the lab matches the genetic makeup of the third species that Helianthus anomalous found out in nature. So good supporting evidence that indeed that Helianthus anomalous 
naturally occurring out, uh, out, in the, out in the environment is likely produced as a result of hybridization between those two other species of sunflowers. So again, just another way, uh, one, one example in which new species are thought to arise through hybridization. So that concludes our discussion of the formation of species.